This podcast is brought to you by Mad Company, a nonprofit theater company based out of New York City. Hello, and welcome to another episode of One Hail of a Conversation. My name is James Hale. I am your host for this podcast. Uh, with me today is the wonderful actor, director, creative, um, and all around great human being, Annie Kafalis. Hi, Annie. How are you? Hi, James. I'm good. How are you? I'm well, thank you. So, Annie, you and I met at Lambda um, mm -hmm. a couple years ago, three years ago now. Wow. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, that happened quick. Um, <laughs> you hail from a couple of different places. You're from Chicago. You grew up down south a little bit. You also went to school in Wisconsin. Um, where do you say you're from? Well, the short answer would be I say I'm from Chicago. People from Chicago would be in an uproar about that okay. because technically I gr um born in St. Louis and then spent a lot of time in Decatur, Illinois, which if you're not sure where that is, point to a map of Illinois and then point to the dead center. Okay. That is it. And then I lived in Chicago and then I lived in Milwaukee and then Chicago again and then Savannah, Georgia and then London and now here. So I just say Chicago. Chicago. Chicago, excellent. One of one of many places, maybe. <laughs> so before we dive into sort of what you're doing now, I wonder if you could just sort of track your journey, maybe from what made you want to become an actor, a director, and then how you found your way to Marquette, and then Lambda, and then here. Like what what as brief as briefly as you feel, um, what does what did that journey look like? My answer of how I became an actor is very boring in the sense that like I've never done anything else. When I was, um, I've been told when I was two, I used to stand on top of fireplaces and put my arms out and yell at people. So that was my stage. And, you know, when they ask a kid, what do you mean when you grew up? I said a princess and an actor. Um, naturally. So, nat naturally. So I never, I never had that moment of, and now I think I'll be an actor. It was always there, mm. um, which is the boring answer. And people roll their eyes at that, but I don't have another answer. Sure. I was deadly, deathly, deadly, whatever, afraid of auditioning when I was a teenager. Mm. Um, so college, the idea of auditioning for colleges made me kind of want to jump in front of traffic. So sure. Marquette is, I wanted something small. Well, that's not really true. I wanted to go to New York or to California, but my parents took a map of, Ill map of the Midwest, made a circle and said, don't go beyond the circle for college. <laughs> And as an 18 year old, I was like, this sucks. But then I found Marquette and I have pretty good intuition. So I got there and I felt this overwhelming wave of calm. And then they told me, you don't have to audition to be in the theater program. And wow. it was small enough. It was 60 people. And I did. I was in 10 shows. I directed five. I helped costume design. I helped build sets. I did everything. Wow. And I really appreciate that small program. And then... Lambda was always kind of on my radar in the back of my head. And when I decided I wanted to do a master's, I decided, okay, now I'm going to do the whole competitive auditioning cutthroat conservatory thing. Sure. And my audition for Lambda was wonderful because Rodney and I sat there and talked about cupcakes and muffins for about five minutes. And then he said, okay, do your thing. I did my thing. He goes, do you have more monologues? I did a couple more. He goes, do you have more contemporary? I did a couple more. We talked about the cold because he hated Chicago weather. <laughs> I was the first of the day and he said his first in Chicago. Then I went home. And then a couple of weeks later, I got a call. And Amazing. that was, it's ironic that I was afraid of auditioning and that was my audition. Yeah. Which the universe always has a way. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> which was, is pretty it funny. Was it was. And I mean, I'm not bad, but <laughs> I just don't <laughs> like auditioning. Right. That's a pretty gentle audition. Exactly. Oh, I don't like auditioning for programs. Auditioning for shows is very different. A program is. Sure it's so much bigger in your head than it would be to do something just a normal audition right. yeah that's how i got to lambda it was at the end of the question or something. sure yeah so you said lambda had always been on your radar mm -hmm. how was that i feel like there's lots of especially americans who even if they're into arts and drama and theater they aren't as familiar with the uk program i mean lambda is one of the top i think five in the world it is flex that's <laughs> a humble flex for us yeah it's one of the top five in the world. And when I was younger, I was like, I have to be the best. Mm -hmm. And I looked up the best programs and I auditioned for all the best ones. And Lambda stuck. And also, I mean, to chalk it up to my intuition, Lambda always felt like it was going to be a thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that sounds really like, but... I, I understand that, yeah. Yeah. So, and then when the vibe of the audition was just completely muffins and cupcakes <laughs> and Shakespeare, it was great. <laughs> so, but yeah, I always... 
I always had just because I was not maybe going to the best top theater college or like my high school what middle of nowhere 200 people I was always tracking the best yeah so I knew you knew all right very yeah. cool I mean I I didn't know lambda was a thing yeah you know, I like heard its name in passing once I mean you also weren't an actor from the go. start that's true that's true. I you are I you are a little transformer. I came to it late. Yeah, I'm I cannot al- relate. I'm always always picking up on things. <laughs> um, very cool. So Lambda was a few years ago. You moved here basically immediately after graduation. Yeah. I mean, there was yeah. A, there was a I was. That you I spent a couple months back in Chicago with my family at Decatur, whatever, and then I came here in January of 2021. Right. Right. Uh, COVID makes things difficult. Ah uh, yes. So you came here and then. You, so you are currently super busy. You are doing a lot of stuff. Were you, this was early 2021, were you working pretty immediately in theater then or did it take you a while to build up some steam? It took me a while. I would say it was a combination of a lot of things. I would like to blame fully COVID, but it, I mean, like it wasn't really fully COVID. Sure. I was adjusting to a new area. I didn't know anyone in New York in the theater mm-hmm. scene all that much. It takes. It took a while to get started, but once I got started, I was fortunate enough to keep going and making connections. So yeah. no, not really. I would say the first, um, my first show in the city was June of twenty twenty one, right? Yeah. All right. Well, that's that's quick. I mean, that's six months after landing here. So wait a minute. It might have been the next year. I don't remember. But um, I mean, twenty twenty two would make more sense to me because I don't think even I think it was twenty twenty two. Broadway wasn't even open until again. Fall, I'd like so. to blame COVID. I think it was a little bit of COVID as well as just me adjusting and other life things. Just got me so theater was the last thing on my mind after moving to the city, yeah. and a lot of things were happening for me that I I kind of let it let myself be in the background. And then once COVID kind of lifted, I was sure. like, gotta get my shit together. Right. I mean, that makes sense. That's that's often how it goes, and mm-hmm. you know we've. I think a lot of us are like that, actually. Totally, yeah. yeah. And I've, I've talked to lots of people, either on this podcast or not, who, you know, it takes years and years to sort of build up momentum and build up steam. And, and then once you do, it just... And then eventually, right, eventually it, it starts, going. it has its own momentum. Um, right. Which you could build a right, <laughs> right. <laughs> So far. So I want to talk about, you've had a, you've done a few things um, recently. Actually, let's start with this. You are right now in tech for a, a workshop production. We were, we were chatting before we um, hopped on the mics here. Will you tell us a little bit about this project? I actually don't think I ever got a name for it. Oh, yeah. I didn't tell you the name of That's why. Um, this is it's so much fun. I it's called like a queen or whatever. OK. And it is about 17 year old high school boarding student girls all competing to be class president. And they end up basically trying to kill each other to mm-hmm. get into Yale. And as, as happens. As, this, I actually had someone tell me this isn't far off from their boarding school experience, oh, and that makes, made me a little nervous for yeah. them. As <laughs> <laughs> didn't ask too many follow-up questions. It's with HB Studios in Greenwich Village. It is so much fun. I found this through someone who saw Amish Project and the one-woman show I just did and asked me if I'd be interested in auditioning. It's really fun. It's cool. I've never been a part of um, a workshop that wasn't like a stage reading. Mm. um so it's interesting to like see two actors have their scripts on hand because that's equity rules for um a workshop that's not a stage reading it's it's cool it's interesting it's just act one right now being produced and then hopefully in the new year the whole show will be because the whole show is nuts it's it's crazy um <laughs> act one ends crazy but it's, it's it's really fun i'm having a really good time with it wonderful so speaking of the amish project this was your one woman show um you did this at the th- Secret Theater in Queens. I is, did. is that correct? That Excellent. Is correct. Um, this was produced by Between Us Theater Company, which is your you. This is a theater company you helped start, or you you found and are now on the board of. What's the, I what's the am on there? the board of now. My really good friend Emil is the man who started it he is an immigrant and then his friend alessandro is also an immigrant who actually lives in london right now doing london theater oh wow and they started this company for basically untold stories and for minorities and immigrants etc and they asked me to be on the board after i was in their production of egg which Mm. is the post-apocalyptic drama which was very fun and they were looking for a piece of work that hadn't been done a lot and a story that hasn't been talked about a lot and maybe representing a group that hasn't been talked about a lot. And they were having a hard time finding something that they wanted to do. And so I recommended Amish Project, which is about an Amish community and a school shooting that happened there um, in 2006. And I pitched it and they went for it. And this is my second time doing it. So they helped produce it. And now we're working on 
doing our second show, which I think we're going to do a little bit of a classical thing. I think that's what we decided. Very cool. Yeah, we haven't we we have a meeting this Sunday, so we gotta we gotta talk about it. But yeah. <laughs> right, plans must be made. So that's fascinating to me that this is the second time you've done the Amish Project, which is a one woman show with is it seven seven distinct characters. characters? Yeah, uh, that's a lot. Um, you did this show. Correct me if I'm wrong. As your like senior. Th- thesis at marquette that is correct okay so you have this is the same show you're doing it in two different times two different places two different productions i mean it was directed by different people very different that is something that i feel like not many actors at any stage ever get the chance to do Mm -hmm. is go unless it's maybe a shakespeare um go back and revisit a show under different circumstances different directions can you just talk about what that was like as 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 a creative but also specifically as an actor and performer like playing a familiar part under unfamiliar circumstances what was how how difficult was it to approach the second time you did it you did it without preconceptions from the first or or did you not did you keep your preconceptions i would say that for the first we rehearsed for 6 months for this current one for Amish Project, yeah. Six months. Six wow. months. That was my choice because after doing the first time, I really wish I had dived deeper into some of these characters. And when I did it the first time at Marquette, we only really dived into maybe five of them. Hmm. There were two of them that we didn't look at as much. And I wanted to, I wanted people to be so clear in their head of who each character was and had think that, oh, I know this person. Mm-hmm. And in order to do that, I made the decision to do six months of rehearsal, <laughs> which was very tiring. That's, yeah, that's um, insane. But I mean, it, it's just me. So we did a lot of it in my apartment, um, which was great. You didn't have to rent out of space, Love that. Um, <laughs> which is great. I would say for the first couple months, it was a lot of, oh, I don't know how to say, I don't know how to do this any differently than I did before. And my director, Dominica, was so great at kind of shredding down what I thought of each character, except maybe one. There's one character that probably stayed very similar. And building back up from what what we were talking about versus what mm-hmm. i had before so okay. that it wasn't as hard as i thought maybe the first couple of months of me being like oh i wouldn't think of it that way but that makes sense versus the last time it was very set in my head it it was very different this time yeah in the sense that like a it's been five years since i did the last one so i have a whole master's program in between yeah. different life just like different life experience i'm older and also um more understanding of how to develop characters I think I did a good job of it at Marquette, but even my mom, who saw it twice in the city here, said this is so much better than the first time, which is a backhanded compliment, but <laughs> she meant thanks, more mom. so. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, mom. She meant more so of like, I this show was, I understood the characters more, and she also said my, she said that my dialect and articulation was better, so thank you, Lambda. Hey, there we go. Which is very funny to me. Yeah, so it, it was a lot easier this time, actually. Sure. I think because I'm a more established grounded actor it was a lot easier and i had more fun diving really deep into the characters in ways i probably hadn't before which i think made it better sure yeah but so you did it sounds like you did sort of approach the initial rehearsal process for this second show in new york holding on to everything that you had already done with marquette i mean obviously you've already done some work so that makes sense to me but it also feels risky from the outside, like, let me approach this show thinking or feeling certain things about these characters already. Let me give you an example. Yeah. This, uh, the six-year-old girl that I play. Yes. Who was a crowd favorite. <laughs> besides Always. Besides the murderer, actually. She was the one that was most talked about besides oh, the killer, which, okay. great. Um, <laughs> That's a little... Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and because people were, people were really, um, really surprised that I could play a child that, well, mm-hmm. for reference, my type is I never get to play children. I mean, obviously, I never get to play children and I never get to play the comedic role. I'm always playing someone really dramatic and like straight laced. And that's sure. kind of what I'm good at. But when I walked in for the rehearsals for Velda, this the six year old, I had everything in my head the way I'd said it before. And my dialect was different. Mm. And my director was like, have you ever heard a child talk about like draw and talk at the same time? And I was like, I don't know if I have. And this character draws the entire time of the show. And she's like, why don't you give her a lisp and see if that helps you? 
And I gave her a lisp. And then it it naturally helped with like when children breathe really quickly and they have a lot to say. The breath came with it. And then the pitch went higher. And then it it was less on my vocal cold, vocal folds, cold cords, whatever. (laughs) And it was a lot of just the faster I drew, the more I had a lot to say. And then this would happen. And then I added the lisp and it made the whole character fall into place. I was like, I know who this little girl is. I have met her. I was not her because I my voice was a lot weirder when I was a kid. But I have met children like this. Fair enough. And it was just a simple little thing of, cool, I like what you're doing, but like a six-year-old wouldn't be that put together. And mm. I'm like, you are correct. That's it's little things point. like that, that the character completely shifted. Or um, the character of America, the New York pregnant girl. Um, a, we made her from New York instead of what, where she's written to be from in the script, which I liked that difference because I got to try a New York dialect which was really cool yeah it worked it it, it was hard i thought my <laughs> chicago dialect would help it did not oh, no. <laughs> it did not help i i worked with a dialect coach actually on that from uh stella adler studios and that was really hard it, sure. he said i did better than i he thought i would but it was still really hard another kind of backhanded compliment i get a lot just collect those i get a lot <laughs> um but that was really fun and her once i added the the new york accent her entire posture just changed completely from how i was doing it the first time and her like leading with my belly which she's pregnant but she's not showing so the first time i did it i was more like upright and bubbly and i'm like she would be but she'd also have this like she's back on a hip she's probably playing with the nails she has to lead from her stomach yeah and that changed the whole character it was fun that's super cool yeah yeah it it was a lot of um to me, it sounds like then a lot of the work was physicality or uh, or vocal changes more so than like the psychological digging in because you'd already done some of that. A little bit, but also it was like um, we also like paired this. So the show, if you took all the seven characters apart, it would just be giant monologues of each character. Right. We rehearsed it like that a couple of times, just doing one character all the way through. Okay. Because the arc makes sense, yeah. especially for Carol, the widow. Her arc makes sense if you just do it all the way through without interjections mm-hmm. from other characters. And my director would be like, okay, who are you talking to? And it couldn't be like, I'm talking to the audience. She, like she's very clearly sitting on a porch at the end of the day after the Amish forgave her. She's smoking a cigarette. She's talking to a friend of hers. She's in an oversized sweatshirt and she's in Hollister jeans and she's looking out at a field and she is just just shoveled. And once I had this very clear image in my head, it's probably like 9 p.m. Everything else made sense where each character was because they don't really talk to each other all that mm-hmm. much. That made things psychologically made things different. Like you would you would talk about this whole story very differently sitting on a porch with a cigarette at 9 p.m. versus having coffee at a restaurant. Um, talking to a friend is very different than like talking to a cop like the yeah. killer who we said we have to like we have to play as if he's alive, even though he's dead when he's talking to the audience is like he's in an interrogation room at a police station. And the first thing that's said to him is, all right, like, do you want to tell us what happened? And he doesn't say anything. And then the cops keep going, look, to clear your name, you have to say what happened. Mm-hmm. And then his first line is, I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to say why. Things like having such a clear idea. If this, w- if this was a movie, what would be happening? Right. I, as a director, I ask my actors a lot that too. If, okay, in the Hallmark film, what are you doing? If this was an animated series, w- what are you doing? If this was CSI, what's happening? That's my little director tool in my brain of like, in a movie version, you could see so clearly something, but on stage people get really tripped up right? because a lot of time it's not that. So you have to just be like, okay, Eddie is in a, he's in like a really, really intense movie um, or he's in like a, like the Jeffrey Dahmer documentary. Like wh- where are you and what is the tone of this and who are you talking to and how do you feel about them? Right. I love doing that just kind of hyp- stuff. Hyper-focusing on the circumstances. Yeah. Or the little girl because she's also dead, but she, we said she was in, um, she was in a police station as well like a one of the child like a in the back room with a child's room and there's a nurse there talking to her and trying to get her to tell what happened but you wouldn't ask a child how did you get shot you'd right. be like can you draw me pictures right yeah wow that's so interesting it's really cool i could talk about that forever <coughs> yeah i mean that sounds like an, an incredible product to be a part of and a really great like because you had done it before coming back to it getting to see it with all the these fresh eyes is just that's so exciting. I was so nervous for people to see it. I was like, I talk to show up so much to everyone around me, and I love Good. this show. As you should. As I, but then m- comes opening night, and I I don't get n- <laughs> humble brag. I don't get nervous a lot anymore when I do shows. I just don't. Maybe when I'm on Broadway someday. 
when yeah. <laughs> but i just don't get nervous but contemporary work is my thing and there's a lot of people in my life that have not seen me do contemporary work yeah. because i've been doing classical and classical is great and i think i'm a good performer but contemporary work is my shit and i've been talking about it forever and right uh, hours before the show i stopped eat, drinking coffee oh which no. i never yeah. do <laughs> james knows i never <laughs> stop drinking coffee as i hold a coffee in my hand currently um i was so nervous and people's reactions were actually far exceeded anything i thought people were gonna be like yeah i really enjoyed it i had people come to see it multiple times i had an old couple bring me an amish doll very creepy looking. yeah that's kind of horrifying it's a very sweet gesture it's very it's still at the theater okay. yeah <laughs> fair maybe it up. Yeah. i couldn't do it that could um, be a prop for someone i had to someday. go pick it up this weekend actually um i had people reach out to me in a way that and a lot of my friends which i mean i love my friends but they're like w i didn't know you were that good again mm -hmm. backhanded compliment but like <laughs> man <laughs> now that i say all this out loud but it it was and i uh, somebody asked me if i would do it again and somebody mentioned there's a festival that happens in new york and actually a manager in la when we were doing showcase mentioned this to me when she saw it's actually kind of why i did it F when did we do showcase in la um, two years ago Over 2021 so I had dinner with a manager and she said, I noticed on your resume, you have this one woman show. And I was like, oh yeah, you know, I did it, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, okay, you need to do it again. And I was like, ah, I don't know about that. And she said, there's a festival in New York for all these one people shows. And then like, it's a contest and the winner of it gets like some sort of produced on television special. Wow. And she was like, you should do it. And I was like, yeah, this woman's crazy. <laughs> and then now somebody brought it up to me again, actually. The guy who runs the theater was like, have you heard of this festival? And I was like, I have. And then so okay. the baby thought is forming yeah. to do it again. Interesting. Yeah, I, I had not heard of this, but yeah, I mean, this that feels like it's kind of talking about how like the momentum keeps moving. Um, you do a thing, someone sees it. You get encouraged to do another thing and then it just builds on itself. And you meet people like the people that run the secret theater are wonderful. And they said, if you ever like want to do a show here, let us know. So now I know of a space. There and you go. Yeah. the other company that shares the space with the theater company is a really cool company that's doing like a bunch of shows this next season. And they sent me their invite audition or they're like, do you want to assistant assist direct assistant direct, whatever. Or like my wonderful friends at Arachne Theater, which is a classical mm. company. Um, I'm hoping to direct stupid fucking bird for them this next year wow great play it, wonderful play i wouldn't do the sequel but the, the stupid but, fucking but aaron bird. but something by aaron posner yeah M a little bit more my speed the more people you meet and i think the most cliche thing i ever told someone was like somebody was like how do you do with theater people and i was like i have gotten a lot of productions because i've just made friends with these people yeah and I, that's something that was never talked about in the networking seminars we go to and the stuff they used to teach us at lambda like if you're friends with someone and they do shows and stuff they'll always remember you yeah. and that's like whoa what a concept besides like networking like i'd be a great whatever yeah. i'm friends with some of these people and they're like hey do you want to do this production and i'm like yeah i do yeah. there's no connection like being in a show with someone because being it's a genuine fucking friend to yeah. people it's yeah. you know if the whole industry worked like that that would be a lot different <laughs> but one day. one day i mean we know it's like we're, we're friends and i'm all the women people are friends and it's the same same ordeal totally yeah i mean that was the whole idea behind mad company is we like each other. We want to do shows. Bada yeah, bada boom. exactly. It and I, you guys always run through my head when I'm doing um, productions or people ask me for things. You guys are always the first people I think of. Oh, <laughs> um, so let's pivot a little bit. You mentioned um, your directing uh, sort of way in and you are a, a director who has been working quite a lot in New York. First of all, how do you balance performing and directing? Is there do you have to think about focusing on one or the other for a particular point do you just take whatever project comes how do you how do you split your time how do you split your energy um and i'll, le I'll leave the question at that how how do you deal with sort of these two distinct but not completely separate interests and personas that you have my answer is really lame because <laughs> um i when i'm a director i will only think with the director's brain when i'm an actor i will only think with an actor's brain i kind of turn off my director brain when i'm in rehearsals even mm -hmm. if something even if a director does something that there might be a split second i'm like wow i would do that to so differently as a director but i think i i understand my intention when i walk into a rehearsal room very clearly that i just don't even tap into the other side sure. i love directing i i actually at lambda 
um, I was up for two. I was up for both programs. I was up for directing and I was up for acting. Right. And acting was picked. And I, I think I chose acting because I, I wanted to learn more about it. Mm. Directing, I wanted more experience before I started to learn about it. And I've been thinking about directing in schools, but I, I love directing and. I yeah I have I have done a lot in New York. You're right. I, did, I guess I didn't really think about that. And I'm gonna be directing um um a, a one one act in a couple months. I think. I'm I like directing. I miss it. I haven't directed in a while. Yeah, I directing makes the most sense in my brain. Sometimes acting doesn't make a lot of sense in my brain. Sure. Um, especially like contemporary acting work makes a lot of sense to me, but a lot of times something classical doesn't make sense from an actor perspective, but a director perspective, it does. Mm. Um, I've been directing since I was like little, I used to, in grade school, I used to direct the, um, Christmas pageant plays. Oh, no way. Yeah. I would do the whole Mary Joseph thing. I would cast it and I would stage it. Um, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure it was a nightmare. (laughs) Well, I'm sure. (laughs) But and then I yeah I really like it I, in my day-to-day life I'm a trainer I think there's something about this idea of like teaching isn't the right word but teaching and leading in a sense of something that I really like to do like the arts or um, fitness or something it makes a lot of sense to me and I know how to co- I like communicating with someone I like talking to actors and every actor works in a very different process which as an actor is very frustrating when you're working with someone that doesn't have the same process yeah. but as a director it's really encouraging and very challenging in a good way because then you have to learn how do I talk to this person how do I relate this and then I started doing if this was a movie what would be happening and that was the most universal question that people understood when I directed and then we could start everyone knows what that means everyone has seen movie or they've seen an animated movie or something that we then we could start a conversation and get them to their best spot to perform as opposed to me just like barking commands yeah and once I figured out it was like a little puzzle I really like puzzles so it made a lot it was really fun for me and it made a lot of sense very cool Mm -hmm. so you the most recent thing i've seen that you directed was our mutual friend anais's uh one woman show (laughs) six stages of a breakup which correct me if i'm wrong it premiered at the edinburgh fringe it premiered in the camden fringe in in london fringe and then moved to edinburgh it went from camden to edinburgh to the penn theater in london to the penn theater london again um here in new york and then it'll be at another theater in london in may right yeah yeah. So it's been it's been traveling around it and it's it's very good. Um <laughs> both because of Anais and because of what you've done with it. What was that process like working with so Anais, for those who don't know, went to Lambda with us as well. So what was the process like working with someone who you know super well, you two lived together for a year, um, to create her show, also put your stamp on it and then see it move to all these different places? What was that like? It was a lot of fun. Um, The show has gone through five drafts. The ending was slightly different each time. And we had theaters give us feedback about, we like your show, but the ending needs to be like this if you want it produced here, et cetera, et cetera. Interesting. Which is interesting. It it was for the better. Um, There was a theater in London that gave us a suggestion that completely changed the tone of the play. And it needed to come from the theater, Mm -hmm. I think, at that point, because I could give suggestions, but because it's such an intimate piece of bits of her story and bits of my story of just relationships in general to have someone objective give us an out a perspective from like um a third party audience was actually really helpful and it changed the show in a really good way yeah it was good it was a lot of, a lot of collaboration um yeah. it was just Anna East's show for a while and then we found ways to like i added couple stories and lines in of my own personal just relationship experience in there which made it part of mine of them the way we directed it I'm really big on if someone is doing a one person show and they speak as somebody else to change locations to have characters live in different spots etc which is what I did with Amish Project yeah and once we added that for her that made more sense and then it was a big trust thing of trusting me with this baby of hers yeah and yeah, it was very collaborative. Um, and every time it's something new or I tell her to do something ridiculous and she'll question it for a second and then she does it and then she's like, what if we did this? <laughs> so it's things like that where the other shows I've directed aren't as collaborative per se, but this because it's more, a like you said, it's a, it's a friendship, it's a bond. And also the show is constantly being rewritten. There's constantly yeah. things being added. 
so yeah that, that was that was a different process than the rest of my directing i'd say absolutely yeah i mean i, I can imagine working with the performer who's also the writer who can change things sort of at will it's is tricky a, yeah. it's tricky to work with an actor who's also writing the show because they're two of their brains are on and if one part of their brain is unhappy the other one will also be unhappy that's really interesting you know what i mean yeah if someone takes slight like why would you change this as a writer then the actor's like well i don't want to change this <laughs> it, it's something like that so it's a, it's a tricky dance interesting i assume this is the only one one person show that you have directed no no, what was the other one? A one man Christmas Carol. <laughs> okay, what is this story? <laughs> a one man. Well, Charles Christ Dickens wrote it. Um, yeah, that. Wow. It was. La it's last year. It's actually happening again this year. Oh, that's what I'm directing right now. Um, <laughs> she forgets about her projects. I do. I so last year at the ATA Theater, the American Theater for Actors, which is on Fifty mm Fourth, -hmm. Sean Coffey, who is a wonderful, wonderful Muppet of a person, um, he knows us. I've called him that. He. Ad adapted Christmas Carol for one man it's been done on Broadway by um what's his name Sir Pat Sir Patrick Stewart and oh, okay. all those kind of people um but he adapted it his own way and asked me and my really good friend Zenya who is a head of Arachne Theater Company who I met right. her we became friends and now we do all basically all of our projects together um either my projects I bring her on or she brings me on for hers and he asked us to direct it and so she handled a lot of story and fluidity and i handled his performance like as a movement and voice okay, and stuff sure. we tag teamed that was that was 55 characters that oh he God. did and this poor man we destroyed <laughs> we it was boot camp it was actors boot camp it was so much fun everybody re i got really good reception for that show and now it's being Another theater company saw the show and asked us to do it for them. So we're doing it for Red Monkey Theater Company. And the cool part is this show is in a Victorian mansion in the Bronx. Whoa. Okay. So you go from a couple different rooms to do like the story. It's immersive. Yeah, it's it's actually site specific. It fits very well with the Christmas That's Carol. Like one cool. room is the Cratchit's house, and one room is his counting office. So then, like the room where there's all the ghosts that come in, and this it, it's cr a the place is haunted. I walked in and I said this place is haunted, and the people that run the theater company go, yeah, we've heard that before. Oh my God. <laughs> but I, I love a good ghost. So um, yeah, that so I. I'm actually, for whatever reason, one people's shows are becoming my thing. So if you are listening and if you have a one person show you'd like to be directed, I'm very familiar with that at this point. It's That's really right. fun. AnnieCafalis.com. Reach Annie out. AnnieCafalis.com. Okay. Well, so that, that leads me to my next question kind of nicely. So you have done multiple one person shows. You've also directed ensemble pieces. Mm -hmm. What are some of the differences between directing a full show, multiple characters that a single person plays and directing a show with multiple cast members multiple cast members if you're doing a scene with someone and you're directing it you are working with two sets of reactions two sets of perspectives two sets of opinions mm -hmm. two sets of eyes ears arms whatever for a one person show you're working with one perspective that needs to be split into two and mo for instance let's take six stages of a breakup the 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 second character in that show is the man jamie he right. he does speak she does speak as him but he's not he's the second character and he's not really in it but she needed to create his his perspective his reactions his story so clearly that the audience knew the character mm -hmm. same with Amish project if i didn't create all seven people very distinctly it would just be me as me telling you a story versus right. you being in the story with me and to an ensemble of actors you already have your perspectives there now it's about okay blending everyone else's interactions as opposed to here's one person split into different perspectives and make them interact i would actually say it's more work for multiple ensemble members sure. because then you don't ha you don't get to create from scratch the other perspective right it's already there you you have a molded clay and it's your job to take a little bit of water and mold it versus one person's like, here's a giant thing of clay, split it, uh, split it up and make it and what you need to. It. Interesting. Do you yeah. have a preference for working with one or the other? With, I, with more I love people, doing ensemble. Um, sure. I had a really great time directing Enrique's piece. Something far away. Oh, my God. A, um, I had really good actors. Kelly is a friend of mine, and I, oh my God, I knew she'd be great for that part. And then Alessandro, who's a wonderful actor, came into auditions and was absolutely hilarious. They were really fun because 
they I gave them a lot of homework because the idea of the show is sure. that you can't you can't look at each other and you can't see anything. Mm. So I asked them on day one to come in with basically a design of their apartments that they're in, basically a sketch of who they're talking to, what they're wearing and what they had done that day and the day before. And then once they gave me their answers, they were really timid at first. And once we got into it, it was like playing make believe. And then once they had did like done that, we went, okay, cool. Now we're going to do it. And then we work from there because everyone's talking to someone, even if it's like the whole idea of you're looking out in the distance. I'm like, no, you are each talking to a version of death. Is death a police officer? Is death a friend? Interesting. Is death a cat? Kelly made death a cat. <laughs> of course. Death um, is always cats. cats death death is cats. Um, That's super interesting. So for, for context for our listeners, um, Something Far Away was a play that uh, a, a very wonderful man named Enrique approached Mad Company about helping Enrique. him produce because be, uh, he had been accepted into a play festival in Williamsburg. Um, and we matched him and Annie up, um, who collaborated on it. And it was a really nice, it was what, like 25-minute it was great. 30 minutes. Yeah, about um, 25 minutes. Actually, he gave me another piece he wants to work with me on. Oh, amazing. Yeah, which is cool. We After Amish Project. He gave me the Amish Project. And he went, you act as well. And I went, yes, I do. And he sent me the script. Shocking. <laughs> yeah, so that was a really interesting process because I, for me, I was, I, you know, basically put the two of you in touch. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was kind of it. And then I went and saw the play. Having I read the script and then I went and saw your production. Oh, yeah, what did you think of it? Um, I don't think we talked about it. Oh, we didn't talk about it? Well, let's do it live here on our <laughs> podcast for the first time. Um, I thought it was really interesting, yeah. Um, the the play festival in which it was performing was a very uh, eccentric affair. Did you see the Target show? I don't know if I ta- saw the Target show. I think you would know if you saw the Target show. I might have. Show. Okay. I don't think I saw the Target show. <laughs> so, uh, Something Far Away was easily the closest to like a traditional theater piece in the show uh or in this in this festival in this night that i saw um which for me was refreshing because that's i i like my theater somewhat traditional um (laughs) i i yeah i thought it was really interesting um and it's a comp it's a difficult thing to do though there are three characters on stage standing in their sort of their spots speaking out to the audience and they're kind of loosely connected stories about like they do. They do talk to each other. The um. Oh, they talk directly. Okay, the, the masseuse that. and the creepy dad do interact a lot, but they just and actually we stated that he only only one character looks at the other at a very specific line. It was like I have never listened to anything you ever said, and then he's the only he turns his head. Oh, that's right, because that's right. It's the only moment of acknowledgement they get toward each other, yeah. and that was on purpose. And when yeah. it's that was fun when I, I watched it, when someone in the audience went ooh. <laughs> yeah, I actually I really remember that. Um, mostly because it's something about the space in the theater and how everything is sort of these parallel lines running out. Mm-hmm. Um, and after whatever twenty minutes, that's just the world we inhabit. And then all of a sudden, rules come around, or some, something happens to break the rules, and we're suddenly in three dimensions. Mm-hmm. And it's a really shattering moment. But yeah, I I really enjoyed the show. I thought it was Yay. I thought it was good. Um, it felt it felt strongly like uh like a workshop piece mm-hmm. there was there was lots of um work to be done on the script on the on the acting you know there was always more to be done but i i thought it was a, a really strong starting point um do you know if is he planning on doing it again i actually or? don't know he has a different piece yeah that he sent me that i need to read but i i don't know actually i haven't talked to him about that okay we will reach out wow very cool so acting directing personal trainer uh living it up here in the big city yeah, what trying. what else do our listeners need to know about annie kafalas oh god um what do you need to know about me uh uh-huh. or nothing if you don't want them to know anything else about you um i like to hula hoop um oh <laughs> yes so wait looking at your resume here oh god uh <laughs> i mean so a lot of acting credits Professional theater, professional theater, educational, training, 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 skills. <laughs> Down here at the end, we have others. Hula hooping, sheep noises. Uh-huh. <laughs> which, okay. Uh, <laughs> sort of a personal trainer. <laughs> Next item is not fluent, but can cuss you out in Greek. I actually had an uh, agent told me to put that on my resume. Interesting. Uh, a sample right now, please. Skasi. I, I don't know what that means. It means shut up and die. 
<laughs> well, that really one word means shut up and die. Greeks are lazy. Jeez, <laughs> wow. um, so cussing out in Greek, pole dancing. Oh, I do do a lot of pole dancing. Excellent. Uh, air, aerial hoop and aerial silks. I do that as well. Uh, <laughs> e- eclectic and and very. Int- I don't. I'm sure there is not another resume that has these items on them. I mean, I can. I've now upgraded now. Now when I pole dance, um, I pole dance with eight inch heels, and I guess I could do that and make sheep noises at the same time and cuss you out in Greek. Oh my god! I Wait. could do everything together. Can we get a sample of the sheep noises? No. Okay. <laughs> fair, that's fair. No. Fair enough. <laughs> wonderful. Well, Annie, it has been a, a wonderful little pleasure speaking with you here. Um, Thank you, James. Any 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 words of wisdom for our listeners? Words of wisdom or fond farewells or? Oh my! If you're an artist, I challenge you to not take yourself too seriously and not chase dollar signs when it comes to projects because Mm. you will probably miss out on a lot of potential connections that will lead you to dollar signs in the future it's very cryptic but Mm. i've taken a couple jobs that did not pay and have gotten me in agent interviews and in rooms i probably wouldn't have gone in the first place that would be my cryptic wisdom love it make those sheep noises people do the weird art (laughs) oh there it is (laughs) beautiful um and with that bombshell and with that (laughs) uh thank you so much for listening this has been one hail of a conversation my name is james hale i was here with annie kafalis i hope you have a wonderful rest of your day y'all bye bye Thanks for listening. To learn more about any of the creatives who spoke in this episode, check out their social media links in the episode description.